All right, uh, I see familiar faces. So this is what it must feel like performing in like high school theater, uh, like having parents around. Um, so I've been giving a lot of talks this year and I didn't give any talk until this year. And my most recent one was that actually at Gogaruko uh, where I made two like huge mistakes. One was my uh, live demo sort of worked and it's actually worse than like totally not working because like you're almost there, right? Um, the other one is uh, my presentation crashed towards the end. So I actually have a fix for both of them. So this time I, there's no live demo. So like you guys don't have to worry or get nervous. I'm certainly less nervous. Uh, the other is I had the wrong operating system presentation tool combination. Uh, I was using a Mac, but I had Microsoft PowerPoint, which apparently is not a good combination. So this time I'm on Keynote. But I'm on Yosemite, so that might be an issue. <laughs> All right, so a quick show of hands. How many of you have heard of Fluent D? Yeah, because I cheated, because I just gave away stickers. So some of you just got stickers. And if you want stickers, there are more stickers here. How many of you use Fluent D in like dev or production? Excellent, like there are two people who are brave enough to admit. So I'm going to give a quick overview of what Fluentd is today, what the use case is, and hopefully talk about internal architecture a little bit, as well as like where we're sort of headed in the next year or so. So who the hell am I? Uh, I am Kyoto Tamura. Uh, that's, my, that's how you can harass me publicly. And I work for this company called Treasure Data, uh, where I work as developer relations person. And what that means is I get to come to a cool event like this and uh, listen to other really smart people about open source. And I also happen to be a Fluentd maintainer. But staying true to my uh, Japanese heritage, and like I'm going to start with a bit of self-deprecation, except my self-deprecation is actually just true. So first of all, I'm a Ruby noob. Uh, I didn't know that Ruby had Lambda. Like this morning, Mats talked about uh, static typing. Uh, I like that as an idea, but I think that would make Ruby a little too hard for me to program in. So we'll see. Um, the other thing is I'm, I'm a Fluentd noob too. That's the contributor graph and the top six people, and I'm at the sixth. And the natural question to ask at this point is why is it this sixth guy or sixth person uh, giving a talk and not the other five people who clearly did more work, right? Well, I asked them, and they have like all these excuses. Right? <laughs> And uh, actually, the guy to my uh, right or left is uh, my boss, his CTO, because he's like a CTO. He's actually busy, unlike me. And I was like, you know, like San Diego sounds really cool. <laughs> uh, I come from this like really expensive uh, city with a lot of rain called San Francisco, and um, it's it's really nice to be here. It's my first time, and also the first RubyConf. <laughs> actually, uh, who's the first time I hear? All right, I feel less lonely now. Keep clapping. So I didn't mean literally, but that works too, because then I don't have to talk. And you, can, you guys can just clap for the next 45 minutes, right? Um, so what's Fluentd? Uh, we tried to, and this is like probably the most straightforward way of describing it. And I'm going to try to unpack, because this sounds like, you know, just like another distributed software. So it is, first and foremost, a data collection tool. Like if you have logs or any kind of event data, uh, think, think about Fluentd. And uh, when I say event collection or data collection, usually like, you have a system like this. And you know, there are a lot of scripts. Uh, some are written by people who are no longer with you. Uh, some are like, really brittle. And this is not really anyone's fault, because logging is not anyone's priority when you're shipping like, the version 1. But eventually, it becomes really painful. And Fluentd tries to, clearly, I didn't practice this. Um, Fluentd tries to solve this problem by unifying it. And of course, this is like a highly, highly optimistic picture. It takes actually months to get there. But it does help you get here. The second point is it's extensible. And uh, there's this guy called uh, Sada Furuhashi who wrote the first version of Fluentd. And uh, the core philosophy of Fluentd is that the core program should be reasonably small and should only do the most important things that nobody wants to like, deal with, but important. 
So the idea is like, uh, I'm gonna touch a bit more about each one, but error handling, message routing, uh, making sure that you use up all the CPUs that you have, stuff like that. And delegate the rest to the users who actually have very specific use cases, right? Like reading data from particular data sources and parsing some like gnarly custom formats, buffering the data in the way that you really want to and have control over that, and write out data to where you care. Because frankly, like the logging software is pretty vacuous without having a destination that you want to, to use and care and deal with. And finally, formatting the data. So I'll, I'll deal with those too. So one way to think is, the core concerns um, just about the, the common cases and the plugins is where the use case specific stuff is delegated to. And it also tries to be reliable and this in two senses. Uh, one is transfer the data reliably. Uh, log data, depending on what kind of log it is, it's very important that you don't lose them. And the way we think about it is like traditionally, like when you try to move data from point A to B, uh, it, the first thing that you naturally do is some version of rsync. And the pro this, like, this is not the worst solution, right? Like, rsync is available everywhere. But the, the real problem with this is that data transfer does fail. And when that fails, especially when you're doing in like daily batches, you start to have this issue like, oh, like, the, the load that failed last night and because of this stupid encoding issue, now I'm gonna have to do two days worth. And like the, on the second day, oh, the data format changed down upstream, so like I have to do it for three days and four days and five days and before you know, like you're just like permanently behind. And the way Fluentd tries to deal with this is think of like log data more as street and rather than collection of files and try to get the data moving like in smaller bits and pieces so that if like certain transfer fails, and it does, it can handle it much better because it's like a smaller thing to worry about. And I'll talk a little bit more about this when I go through the plugin, um, buffer plugin. And the other thing is a reliable process. So this is like a meta reliability because it's not about the code per se, but the process around um, your data engineering. So like look at this, I mean, this is like a, like a another rendition of the diagram that I had earlier. But which is more reliable, this or this, right? Like this, like you have no idea what's going on where. Whereas here, all the data sources go to FluentD, and it's FluentD's job to decide where the data should go. And FluentD has this notion of data, um, tagging the data and the routing data based on the tag. And I'll show a bit of a config file later to explain this point. And uh, the diagram that I like to use, or the, the pseudo computer science argument that I try to use is go from M times N to M plus N. Meaning that if you have M data sources that need to talk to N storage or backends, uh, don't make it a multiplicative. You shouldn't have M times N data flows. You should have M plus N data pipelines. So that's, a super quick overview of what Fluentd is. And now the fun stuff, which is how the hell is this thing used out in the wild? So the very first one is simple forwarding. Uh, you have some files and it's always in files, but you also have like a new mobile app that you want to track the user behavior on. And you want to correlate it to and like come up with something really smart. And it's pretty simple to do in Fluentd. This is the actual configuration file, I haven't tested it, that actually uh, listens to the log file that is a var log, htbd log, that's the top left. And it also listens to the TCP um, port. And send that data to, um, to a backend. Here it's in MongoDB. And I don't work for MongoDB, but it's actually one of the most popular plugins out there along with S3 and I think Elasticsearch. So it's really simple, right? Um, this input is where you sort of d define uh, where the data should go, and the output try to match those tags. Here it's like back end something, and if it matches, the data is flushed out to that output. All right, so that's like the first use case. The second end is basically 
more of the same. Um, this is a very common use case, uh, especially with companies that deploy thousands of servers. Uh, the, the reason is um, when you have a lot of data and you want to sort of separate the concerns between the ones that are ingesting the raw and, uh, data and parsing it and actually sending that data to the backend because both tend to be rather CPU intensive. And one use, user that I know has 2,500 uh, servers running FluentD, and it's, it usually comes in with like one aggregator for like 100 uh, leaf servers that are forwarding data. And you can pretty much send it to anywhere, like all these uh, PAS and IS, and yeah, and that's because the users contributed the plugins to write to those systems. The, the other one that's my favorite is uh, what I call a Lambda architecture because it's cool when you can use a Greek letter. But how many of you have heard of the term Lambda architecture? Cool. All right, so let me explain that. Um, the idea is basically you, you can use multiple storage systems to do both like batch analytics and do more real-time computation. It was coined by this guy called Nathan Mars who wrote a, um, Storm, the real-time computation engine. And Elasticsearch and Hadoop here are just like examples, and it could be something that you rolled out on your own. But the idea is Elasticsearch is going to deal with something that you want to keep track of real time. Like let's say the data source is a patch logs. You want to know uh, what fraction of your requests are 404. But also you want to store all the raw data in Hadoop so that some smart person can run like a very fancy MapReduce job and come up with some kind of user behavior um, insights. So Fluentd is, it sits in front of both systems and bifurcate a data stream and write it out to both places. And it's pretty straightforward to do that. Um, the, this is the, the left hand side of this Fluentd config is actually the same from before. And on the right hand side, I think it's your right, right? Or is it left? I'm left handed, so I tend to get this confused. Okay. The left hand side is the same. The right hand side uh, changed to use the copy plugin, which copies data stream so that you can send data to Elasticsearch and Hadoop. And here's another one, um, CP. How many people know what CP stands for? It's okay, I didn't know until like three weeks ago. Uh, complex event processing. Uh, there's, there's a whole like field of real-time computation. But the idea is you, you, you want to, to apply computation, a series of computations to data streams. So like, again, going back to the Apache example, you want to see the correlation between the site response time and some other data stream. And there, will be, there are systems that deal with this. Actually, the guy sitting over there is gonna give a talk about one such uh, open source solution called Narikra. But there, there are a whole bunch of others, including some proprietary ones. Then you can also tuck on some kind of visualization, like for example, like some, something you hacked up with D3. But the point really is that um, it, Fluentd itself is flexible enough to talk to a backend of your choice, and you can sort of hack away and put together some system in front of it as well. The last one is fairly recent. How many of you know Docker? I get this is a stupid question. How many people have used Docker? Excellent. So I, I actually use it uh, for actually to debug a lot of stuff for uh, Fluentd, but uh, one of the things about Docker containers is that uh, it's actually, there hasn't been a very standard solution to aggregate containers logs themselves. And um, that's actually one new use case for Fluentd that I started to see over the past few months. And actually Fluentd alongside uh, Elasticsearch and Kibana were adopted to Kubernetes, which is the orchestration tool to manage a cluster of Docker containers. So that's yet another new use case where having logging middleware that's highly programmable uh, is really helpful. All right, the, the fun part, architecture. And also this is like right about where my knowledge starts to get very shaky. So ask questions to harass me. So 
like, uh, like at the highest level, and this is what Fluentd looks like. As the data goes through the system, the input deals with accepting inputs, and you can write your own parser to parse it, and the data is buffered, and the output handles where to send the data, depending on the tags that um, the, the input has generated for it. And finally, you can format it for certain outputs. And the good mental model to have right now is that the first two mostly deal with like inputting the data into FluentD, and the other three basically deal with outputting data to external systems. So input plugins, uh, there, there are a lot, like all the, the usual suspects, like UDP, TCP, HTTP, like they're all uh, supported. Uh, another really common one is something called Intel, which is basically tail command, but a little uh, smarter and uh, more flexible. And the idea is you receive logs and you try to assign the tag, and the tag is how you know where the data should go. So if the tag says Apache something, well, it should go to where you want the Apache logs to be stored. And the one important thing is that uh, input plugins are non-blocking in that it has its own event loop that is independent of Fluentd's core event loop. So if something starts to go haywire, it should not affect the rest of Fluentd. And uh, here's actually my, my favorite and probably most common uh, input plugin. It's called uh, tail input. And part of the reason I like this is that like until I started to work with Fluentd, I thought tailing a log file is like the, the simplest thing possible. But but there there's some like there's some evidence to the contrary, right? So first of all, like this class is called the new tail input, if you can read that. And the reason why it's called new in tail input is that because we did a total rewrite. Uh, there's like old uh, tail input. And also it says Towards the end, it says uh, a little more code. And uh, do you know how much more little code? And this is actually only 20% of the rest. And uh, there's like some more comments down there. And there are actually 700 lines of logic dealing with like inode and making sure that whenever like a file is lo rotated, uh, it actually looks at the new file, but as well as the old one so that it doesn't actually uh, miss certain files that are being appended to the old one. And that, this is like one plugin that I know the interface, but the implementation I would never touch myself. I delegate that to more um, informed maintainers. Um, another less complex um, plugin is this one. It's TCP input, and I stripped out some lines, but Again, like this looks really simple, but I'm cheating again because much of the work is done by the superclass base input. So here's a base input, and I'm just uh, excerpting the, the main method on message. And again, like if you get rid of the bookkeeping, all it does is it has a parser um, class variable, I'm sorry, instance variable. And the parser parses a message, and there's like timer record, which gets emitted into Fluentd with a tag that you assigned. So this is a good leeway to what parsers are. So Fluentd has a configurable parsers, and most of the time it's actually handled or coupled with the input, like some inputs just um, have it as part of it. But it parses data into JSON, which is the common data format for Fluentd uh, and throughout and the, the usual suspects, again, is supported out of the box. And here's like a one example of what a parser plugin can do for you. So that is the TCP uh, input plugin from the previous example. And once, when you specify the format parameter, uh, that is a regular expression. So that is actually invoking the regular expression parser, which is part of the core. And there are like some other like named um, regex. So like if you just write down like Apache 2 there, it parses the Apache 2 combined log format. Uh, if you write syslog, it does the sensible syslog formatting. Uh, how many of you know about Grok parser? So there's like a Grok-like uh, parser uh, too. And I had to mention that because I wrote it. <laughs> but it's a third party, so use it at your own risk. 
And this is what it looks like in the regular expression uh, parser. It's the standard stuff. It does a name capture and does a whole kinds of like busy work and emits back the JSON. The next one is buffer. So buffering is really important because uh, it's, it's amazing like what happens when you try to send bits and bytes over the internet. Even when it's local or within the same data center. And the key here is make it configurable so that if you want to buffer, buffer it to the disk, that's supported. If you want to, if you care about performance over some kind of data loss or the, the risk of data loss, uh, you can buffer it to memory. And the internal is pretty simple. Buffer is basically just um, a queue of chunks, and the chunk is an adjustable unit of data. And I think the first issue that you run into, or like the first hurdle when you start deploying Fluentd on lots of machines is tuning the buffer parameters. So we try to make it um, reasonable, but again, it depends on your network conditions and how your cluster is uh, architected and so forth. But the point is, it's, it's pretty configurable, so it should be able to meet your needs uh, as long as you, you're patient enough to, to tune the parameters. And one, so buffer is actually very much tied to the output because the way it works is that uh, when an output plugin uh, tries to output the data, that's when you really like buffer the data, right? For example, like if you're trying to send the data to like S3 on uh, AWS, uh, you want to make sure that like if your network goes down, like the buffer is there and you retry it at a uh, later time. And some output plugins are not buffered especially the ones that are involved like writing to external systems. And a lot of those um, came about because originally Fluentd didn't have like a dedicated notion of filter. So a lot of people use output to, to actually filter data. And that's part of the reason why this is the most common uh, type of plugin that the community has contributed. Uh, there are about like 300 plugins for Fluentd. And I would say about 200, 200 and more of them are up. So like, if, you, if you're thinking of using Fluentd and it's like, oh, I use XYZ SaaS and I use this like storage service, chances are good it's already been supported. And if not, uh, it's pretty easy to get started. Uh, there's a lot of documentation and sample code online. And uh, here's like an example of uh, an output plugin. Uh, this is the pretty basic one that's bundled into the core. Uh, it writes to a local file. And again, I'm sort of stripping out a lot of the code, but the key here is that um, it writes chunk to a file handle, and that's it. So if you decide to write your own, like let's say you have your own like new NoSQL database, I guess that's, that's, not, well, that's not a joke. I mean, you can write it. Um, you, all you need is basically uh, get a hold of or write a Ruby client for that and basically do the, what, I, what you would do to insert data to that system inside of the right method. Finally, uh, sometimes you want to format your data differently than how Fluentd does um, by default. Um, in the past, or like in its early days, usually it was the output plugin author's concern, but we realized that a lot of people, for example, wanted to output as like new line delimited JSON, but that was like done pretty much by the output plugin. So we're actually trying to make that more pluggable. So with the version 0.10.49 and above, you can actually um, use formatter plugin for certain output file, um, plugins. Right now it's S3 and file, but hey, pull requests are always welcome. And again, I, I, I felt like I should write some code or at least copy and paste it. So here's one formatter. Uh, because the data is passed around as JSON and some people apparently just want to get a particular field so there's actually a formatter called single value formatter, which I've always found to be pretty funny. But the idea is like the record is the data and by default it gets the, the field 
um, called message, but you can configure that. So if you have JSON with like a whole bunch of fields, if you just want to output like one, you can actually use this formatter. But there's CSV, there's like TSV, and you can come up with your own, like some kind of key value pairs. Um, it's, it's pretty simple coding in Ruby. So that's like a quick tour of FluentD. And this is like the, the current um, architecture. But we're gonna have a new dedicated filter plugin in the next version. And this is gonna make uh, a lot of filtering or filter-like um, functionalities like a breeze. Like those were possible like, in the past like two and a half years, but they were a little hard to get your like, head, like they were not easy to wrap your head around because you get the data, and I'm gonna put it through this particular plugin, then I'm gonna change the text so that it goes through a different route, and it's, it's, it's quite complex. But in the next version, that major update that we're releasing, uh, filtering is gonna be really easy. So if you have something like, uh, I want to get this data, I want to get rid of those particular fields before I output it to this like, third party because of compliance reasons. Or like I want to get these data, but only, if you filter out everything but data coming from those particular host names, those things are going to be very, very simple to do. And here's my like pretty ghetto looking uh, roadmap. Uh, so the version one, uh, 0 0.1, uh, 12 is the one that's going to come with filter. And also we're going to make a pretty big API change in the next major version or major minor, minor major version. 0.14, and our goal is to really um, uh, consolidate a lot of those changes and release the, the true version one. Um, it's kind of funny to talk about version one because we have a lot of production users now. Uh, many of them, like I was, I never thought that like Fluendi would have as a user like three years in, but the goal is to have the true version one next year, uh, probably in the first half. And right now, like at least at Treasure Data in Fluentd Core, there are like two people, and two people is like a lot of people short of doing everything we want to do. So we're always looking for someone to join us, either as like the part of the community or if you're not get paid to do this, we're always hiring for that uh, role. So some goodies, and this is like one thing I'll get to play, which is a. Uh, UI. Uh, what I think the other uh, main Fluentd guy at Treasure Data is just he just released a version of our package that has this in it. So the idea is up to this point, Fluentd is pretty much driven by command line, um, which is great. I love command line, but I wish I had the same tool when I was first learning how to use this tool. And the the idea is to to make it much easier to uh, administer and test out Fluentd locally. And another one is uh, Treasure Data uh, packages Fluentd uh, for all the major Unix C platforms. And we also do the QA. So a lot of people who use Fluentd in production tend to use this one. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Masa, the main Fluentd uh, package person just released the latest version that bundles the UI that I just showed. And I know this is RubyConf, but I had to talk about the gopher, because like the gopher is like the animal of the year. Um, so one, one issue that I ran into with people who wanted to use Fluentd uh, is that we don't have a very good Windows support. There's an experimental branch, but uh, we've never had a lot of confidence in recommending that to handle high load or mission critical uh, payloads. So uh, we decided to write a very lightweight, um, less feature rich uh, agent in Go that compiles natively to different architectures. It's definitely less mature, so it's sort of paradoxically situated right now because we think it's gonna run better on Windows, but right now I'm not 100% sure. So it's fully open source. It's under Fluent, uh, Fluent D order and pull requests, contributions, bug reports are all appreciated. 
And that's pretty much it. I guess everyone is ready for the break. Maybe I'll give you a head start then. Uh, thanks a lot.